kaleidoscope, new patterns form from the same shapes being put together in a new way. I would like to try changing some patterns in your brain and rearranging your associations between failure and error in the hopes of changing your mindset about being wrong. I understand this might not be an easy task. For most of us, when we think about our experiences about being wrong, feelings of shame and guilt immediately come to the surface. We often associate being wrong with really negative character traits, such as being stupid, lazy, ignorant, immoral, and even worse. Because of that, we often go to great lengths to never be wrong about anything ever. And when we are wrong, we typically deny, avoid, defend, minimize, or excuse the ways that we were wrong as a way to sort of distance ourselves from that event. As much as we may dislike it, being wrong is a big part of being human. It is possible that right here, right now, you may be wrong about any number of things, ranging from the small and inconsequential, you know, maybe blue's not your color, to the huge and existential, like being wrong about who you think you are, your career choices, your political convictions, your choice in partners, your moral and religious beliefs, and even your fundamental perceptions of reality. As unsettling as that is to think about, <laughs> what if we changed our mindset about being wrong? What if we approached rather than avoided that? What if, which, what would happen if, for example, we embraced rather than avoided being wrong? If we sought out opportunities to be wrong? If we moved outside of our comfort zone and build relationships with people who would continually challenge our beliefs? But most importantly, what if being wrong can activate our most human and honorable attributes? What if it is the pathway to connecting us to what is, are these, connecting us to our capacity for empathy, humility, kindness, forgiveness, curiosity, creativity, and courage? Our knowledge is our orientation to the world. What we know about ourselves and others profoundly shapes how we value, define, and judge others. The laws, policies, and institutions we uphold, and ultimately the health of our families, communities, and nations. Scholars throughout time have continually reminded us that the greatest impediment to our knowledge is the illusion that we have it. So essentially, we can't learn what we think we already know. But if, as Catherine Scholz argues, we go through life assuming that we're basically right, basically all the time about basically everything, we can't really tap into those potentially really neat things about being wrong. When we think we know the answers, we stop listening, we stop seeing, and we stop learning. We declare ourselves an expert and make very confident conclusions that often spiral us into an echo chamber where our preconceived beliefs and biases and notions aren't challenged or critiqued. This radically reduces our opportunity to see the ways that we might be wrong about any number of things. We can only revise our understanding of ourselves and amend our beliefs about the world when we can recognize when we are wrong. But, and not without some irony, psychologists have also demonstrated that we're really poor at recognizing the limitations of our knowledge and the extent of our ignorance and errors. So what that means is no matter how educated you are or experienced or knowledgeable you are, we all operate within a really profoundly limited lens. Having blind spots isn't necessarily a human failing. We, just like cars, all have blind spots. We all have areas in our lives where we're uninformed, ignorant, or just plain wrong about any number of things. Whether or not those blind spots hurt ourselves or others, though, really depends on three things. Our conscious awareness of their existence, our ability to critically reflect on and examine those blind spots, and the actions that we take to mitigate or control the potentially negative effects those blind spots might have on others. Our early socializations and unique social identities profoundly shape the nature of our blind spots. This means that our race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexual orientation, religion, age, ability, and so much more 
profoundly shapes what we know about ourselves and others. They inform what others know about us, the stories that are told about us, and our ability to tell different stories or interrupt those stories. These intersecting social identities create a really complex web of advantages and disadvantages for us as we move through time and space. These social identities impact the size and number of blind spots that we have. If, for example, you occupy a privileged position in society, you might have multiple blind spots about less advantaged groups. This might mean that you drive your proverbial car wherever you want, all over the road, without thinking to look in your rearview mirror or worry about your car insurance. It might mean that you're not challenged very often to critically examine your own social location and how that's impacting what you know and don't know about others. And you might not be challenged to critically engage with alternative narratives and stories and experiences that could provide a much needed critique or challenge to your understanding of the world. This has consequences. If you have light or pale skin, it might be harder for you to understand how having dark skin impacts your day-to-day -day life in America. If position, people in positions of power and privilege make decisions without inviting groups that can highlight the limitations of their knowledge and the blind spots in their thinking, they're much more likely to design flawed policies, institutions, and laws that perpetuate systems of power and social inequality like racism and sexism. So what do we do? One way that we can eliminate the blind spots in our thinking is to connect with people and perspectives different than our own. This sort of relational learning and, and critical self-reflexivity, by pairing those two together, those invisible blind spots can become slowly more visible to us. We may discover, for example, that our thinking has been steeped in a white majority dominant narrative and we might begin asking more critical questions about what we know and don't know about the history of the United States. We might discover and more carefully examine some of the biases and stereotypes we have about immigrants, Muslims, LGBT individuals, or black indigenous people of color, and begin to see the ways that those stereotypes and biases don't line up with research, evidence, fact, or the day-to-day -day lived experience of those groups. As an example, I grew up in rural southern Alberta, Canada. It's a stunningly beautiful landscape that is home to three very distinct cultural groups. The Guyana First Nation, or Blood Tribe, which is part of the Sitsa Gates of the P, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more commonly known as the Mormons, and Laurelite and Darius Light Hutterites. My race, religion, and rurality profoundly shaped what I knew and didn't know about my neighbors. This meant that my understanding of indigenous peoples and Hutterites was very limited, incomplete, and inaccurate. I grew up hearing stories that too often perpetuated stereotypes that indigenous people were lazy or alcoholics or to be feared. And the only thing I seemed to know about the Hutterites was that they dressed differently than me. As I grew older and left that community, I was presented with many opportunities to more critically examine how those early socializations had shaped what I knew and didn't know about my neighbors. This allowed me to start unpacking those stereotypes and see all the ways that I had been wrong about so much. And this unlearning and relearning allowed me to revise and restructure my knowledge, and that created a new space for me to create more authentic relationships with tribal community members. Today, I am part of a participatory, community-based participatory research team that works in partnership with the Ipsaligan Nation or the Crow Tribe in Montana. I am Every week, we, our non-Indigenous and Indigenous partners meet to share stories, um, develop meaningful relationships that are mutually beneficial as we work together to collaboratively create greater health equity for tribal community members. 
Instead of the deficit paradigm that I had grown up with and was surrounded in, it's now easy for me to see the absolutist strengths of humor, generosity, language, spirituality, and close clan and kinship ties that lead and guide our work together. I'm continually humbled by and grateful for this relationship. It often reminds me of how limited my knowledge is and how much I need to learn. And it motivates me to continually be vigilant about my blind spots and deconstruct biases and stereotypes as they arise. It's also allowed me to ask critical questions about my own family's story in the larger colonial settler narrative and began examining some of the limitations in the things that I learned within predominantly white, European, Eurocentric, Western institutions about what is the purpose of knowledge, what constitutes knowledge, and from whom. And these paradigm shifts have kept me humble, learning, and growing. At the beginning of this speech, I posed a question. Can being wrong activate our most humane and honorable attributes? I would argue yes. I think being wrong can connect us to what is best and most brilliant about being human. Our capacity to learn, ask questions, be curious, love, connect, create, change, heal, and forgive. If we can recognize when we are wrong and revise our understanding of the world, we can slowly nudge ourselves towards a more inclusive, complex, and nuanced understanding of the world. We often hear the adage that without justice, there can be no peace. If you want peace, you need to work for justice. I would agree. Gregory Boyle also argues that none of that can happen without first a deep underlying sense that we belong deeply to each other. Without kinship, there can be no peace. Without kinship, there can be no justice. We can wage peace by learning how to listen to and understand diverse perspectives. We can wage peace by um, learning how to live, think, love, and work across differences. We can wage peace by having the humility and compassion to recognize when we are wrong and revise our understanding of the world. And we can wage peace by acting on that knowledge and trying to heal the things that divide us so that we can create those healthy, vibrant, just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive communities we all want to be a part of. Thank you.